Welcome to Talatera, a podcast about freelance educators working in natural resource fields and environmental education. Who are these educators? What do they do? Join me and let's find out together. This is your host, Tanya Marion. Today, my guest is Rebecca Kling. Rebecca is an educator, a performer, community organizer, storyteller, and advocate for social change. Rebecca is also an advocate for transgender rights, is involved in the Sierra Club's Beyond Coal campaign, and is the co-founder of Better World Collaborative, a trans, woman, and Latinx-owned consultancy rooted in social justice and the creative arts. I met Rebecca in the pilot of the Earth Stories workshop that was hosted by Story Center. We learned more about this workshop and Story Center in the previous episode. I came to learn more about Rebecca and her advocacy work in this workshop. I learned that throughout her advocacy work, Rebecca uses storytelling as a tool when she works with individuals and organizations. And it is this aspect of her work that we will focus on today. Let's join the conversation. Rebecca, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure and it's wonderful to continue some of the conversations and and discussions we started during the Earth Stories Project and also to get to know you a little better. It's been really lovely. So from what I've read, you began your career in the performing arts as a touring educator. And it is my impression that this was the start of your many, many independent initiatives. Is this, is this correct? This is where you started your, your career as an independent advocate. That's right. I come to advocacy from a... Uh, different path than than many of the folks that I've worked with. And there is no right path. There's no wrong path. Um, I grew up taking theater classes. I was in theater all throughout middle school and high school. I studied performing arts and uh, performance studies in undergrad and started to use all of those tools to tell my own story as a transgender woman and to share performance, solo performance, artsy fartsy stuff with movement and video projection and audience interaction and humor and serious moments and and all sorts of stuff. And what I quickly learned is that I really enjoyed the educational component of that. Sometimes that was working education into performance pieces I did. Sometimes that was through talkbacks or discussions. And that there was something really lovely about that pairing of my personal narrative, my story, the trans rights movement, and elevating issues that a lot of people might not be familiar with, as well as sort of more explicit advocacy, whether it was education or or workshops with colleges and universities or at conferences, as well as um, sort of public education and advocacy through those talkbacks and conversations. And as I started to hear from folks who said things like, I've never seen a trans person on stage, this has really opened my eyes, or I've never heard my, some an audience member might say that they had never heard their own identity talked about the way that I was sharing on stage and that it gave them new information about themselves. And balancing that with, we also need policy change. Social change is amazing and important and critical. And people need to take action and push politicians and pass laws and support the laws that do exist. And that storytelling aspect of my performance work really beautifully slid into more explicit and and maybe more traditional advocacy work with nonprofits or with community organizations and community leaders. One of the things that is always frustrating to me but that we just, we know, we know from studies, we know from research, and it makes sense sort of intuitively is that for most people, just facts and figures are not enough to sway opinion. 
People need stories. They need connections. They need emotional resonance. And you see that whether it's a nonprofit solicitation that you get in the mail that has big glossy photos and stories about who you're helping by donating, whether it's politicians who are talking about the constituents they met and how, you know, particularly during presidential campaigns, they'll always love to trot out, I met a steel worker in Pennsylvania, or I met a single mom in Texas, or I met an immigrant refugee in California. And there's a reason they do that. It's because stories are powerful. Stories are connection. And that really led me more into the advocacy world and to work with the National Center for Transgender Equality in DC, and then more recently with the Sierra Club and doing environmental work to train and the use of coal power in the United States. Listening to this episode are a lot of people who have launched an independent initiative or want to launch their own initiative. How did you start um, s- start your your work as a touring educator? And I'm I'm assuming that's a, that's a theater. That's something specific to theater performing arts. That that label or that title. Certainly, um, many folks in the performing arts, so in the performing arts is not always a um, clear, stable financial career path. Uh, If you're not working at a nonprofit, many of the jobs, whether it's a performance job or something backstage, are temporary. You know, you're working on this one performance or this one festival or this one conference. And then when that's over, you're looking for your next gig. And one of the things I heard over and over from colleagues and friends and other people who were doing that type of performing work is diversify multiple streams of income. And that I really enjoyed doing the more education part as well. And that particularly with colleges and universities where there are um, students who are really excited about learning about identity, there are students who are really excited about sharing their own work. And that pairing a performance. So sometimes I might do, you know, an hour long performance in the evening, and then the next day go and talk in some classrooms, talk to a gender studies class or a performance class or a social sciences class. And that sort of pairing, particularly on college campuses, really made me more marketable and made the work that I was doing easier for colleges to justify putting in their budget. And one of the things that I have tried to be better about as I've continued in my career, is we got to talk about that part too, that that the art in a perfect world, and I would love to be pushing towards this world, we shouldn't need to think about finances when we're creating art, but also artists need to pay rent and thinking about how we can do that in ways that feel good and feel exciting and feel fulfilling is a really important question. And so touring educator, touring performer, touring uh, artist is going to be familiar to a lot of folks who are in that world. And for people who aren't, it's it's a way of pairing different parts of the work that I do or different parts of the work that others do to really allow that organization, that college, that university, that festival, whatever, to get the most bang for their buck, to get that artistic experience, to get that educational experience, to get that advocacy experience, and um, to try and really highlight that these issues need to be approached from a bunch of different angles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Uh, I hear you. Uh, Theater work is seasonal, and environmental education work is also seasonal. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. (laughs) So how did you show your work? How did you tell people what you did, and how did they find you back then? And how did you let them know what you could do for them and their and the people that they serve? Yeah, a lot of that hasn't fundamentally changed for me over the past decade or so. So it's having a personal website, having video on that that showcases the work that I do, um, working with amazing graphic designers to come up with images and posters and postcards and web design and then finding ways to get that information out. So that might be contacting gender studies departments or contacting LGBTQ centers or contacting theater festivals and conferences and sharing work that I've done before, as well as sharing what I'm working on now. When I was first getting started, a lot of that was 
participating in open mic nights to try out new material or was um, participating for free at a performance event a friend might have been organizing or connecting through social networks. And um, if a friend was, you know, teaching at a community college, coming in and to speak to that class and doing those for either free or very, very little money, both as a way to get my name out there, but also as a way to just refine the work that I was doing, that I certainly hope, and I think that this is true, that the work that I'm doing today, I certainly ask more for it than I did 10 years ago. And I also think that there's a re- that it's better than it was 10 years ago, because I've learned and, and refined and um, hopefully, certainly 10 years older, hopefully 10 years wiser. Um, and I've been very fortunate, and we can talk a little bit about how privilege has played into my um, sort of professional career. I've been very fortunate to be able to sort of build on that cumulatively and and to have a list of performances and workshops and trainings that I'm really proud of having done with companies and colleges and festivals and conferences so that these days – it's also easier for me to say, here's an example of my work, here's some video, or here's a a slide deck from another workshop, or here's a description, but also to be able to say, and here's the list of places I've been to, and highlight for an organization that might not be familiar, oh yeah, I recognize some of these names, I recognize that college, or that business, or that nonprofit, and it seems like if they're hiring her, then maybe I should too. Mm-hmm. Yes, you show your work very well on your website. I appreciate it's, that. Thank yeah, you. it's it is so easy to get to um, to get to know you. Really, <laughs> that's how it all started with me, right? I went went to your website, and it's very easy to get to know you, to see what you've done, to learn from you, and through your performances that you do, you know, have on your website. And um, yeah, it's it's just wonderful. So show your work. That is the big takeaway and you do you you point to a wonderful body of work well thank you and I think that also speaks to one of the reasons I was excited to chat with you on on this podcast is I also am a really strong believer in transparency and of helping others learn in the same ways that I learned I, I am incredibly grateful to the performers and educators who were role models to me and who were able to say you got to think about diversifying your income stream, or you got to be careful and and um, thoughtful in how you're sharing your work on your website, or when you're sending out cold emails, wanting to make sure to personalize them. All of those things that, um, again, when we talk about art, particularly in academic const- uh, uh, contexts, when we talk about art on college campuses. The question of, okay, but how do I actually pay my rent doing this isn't always brought up. And and again, I wish that it didn't have to be, but I want to be very transparent and open about how I've made that work. And some of that has been family and parent support. I want to be really clear about that, that I've been lucky, fortunate, privileged, whatever language I feel right on that day to have um, a really strong community of of friends and family who've helped me along the way. And I want to make sure I'm able to try and offer some of that to to folks who are um, still figuring out what their their work looks like or what their craft looks like. Yeah, thank you for that. No, absolutely. Absolutely. There is um, there's nobody launches an initiative on their own, right? There's always this background of support, this network of um, whether they're professional, you know, colleagues, family, and friends. Yeah, absolutely. So you have been working on lots of different projects for 10 years or more than 10 years even now. And so what are you doing now? Absolutely. Um, I have, I always have lots of balls in the air and, um, a piece of Rebecca trivia. My first job after college was working in the office at a circus and performing arts school where I was not doing the fun performance stuff and, and uh, 
had a very bad handstand, but did learn to juggle. That was one of the things I was successful at that, at, uh, that organization. Um, right now, we, we, a friend and I, just launched Better World Collaborative, and that is a equity and social change consultancy. So we're working with um, primarily businesses and trying to help them. Uh, the buzzword these days is diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI trying to help them with diversity, equity, and inclusion in a way that's really practical and hands-on. So to give a specific example from some of the transgender trainings I do, I would much rather people leave with how do I respectfully interact with a trans person and not memorize all of the terms and definitions. I spend a little bit of time on terms and definitions. I think those are important, but you can look those up online. And I would much rather spend time talking with people about, okay, but how do we actually, how does this play out? What do I do if a colleague misgenders someone? What do I do if a community member asks why my company is wasting time on all that trans stuff? What do I do if we're in a building that doesn't have gender neutral bathrooms and I know I have someone who needs that to be able to be at work safely and comfortably? And those sort of practical things Again, it's not that the language is unimportant, but a lot of these workshops we have very limited time, and I would rather just spend time talking about how do we treat each other respectfully, and I can send a link afterwards of here are the words and terms you might be curious about. Um, when there's more time, when it's, you know, whether it's a two or three hour workshop or multi-day workshop or, or a multi-session class, there we might spend more time on the terms and definitions, but really trying to think of um, more concrete. So Better World Collaborative, we um, launched our website and are soliciting clients and, and trying to get that moving. And it's working with a, a friend and movement colleague of mine, Crispin Torres, who also comes from a performance background. He's a musician. Um, he has a uh, Alanis Morissette cover band called You Ought to Know, um, which is great. And we met doing trans advocacy work and both really quickly realized that coming from an arts background, coming from a performing background, there's just so much training and so much diversity, equity, and inclusion work out there that's boring. And that's kind of miserable to have to sit through. And it's not that every second of every workshop I do is an entertaining blast of, of refreshment, but certainly that we are mindful of, and it's really important to us that the work that we're doing is also engaging and entertaining and as much as possible, fun. And that might be things as simple as, I love including cute animal gifts in slide decks of mine, just to break things up and make people smile. It might be finding ways for people to engage in the chat or engage on, there are all sorts of things these days about drawing platforms or that sort of thing. Or, and this goes back to the storytelling and the performance aspect, making sure we're really liberally sprinkling our own stories and stories that we've heard from others around the country so that it isn't just abstract, it's a lot more concrete. And, and hopefully, and I, I believe that this is true, that the way we're framing things and the way we're sharing this information sticks a little better. And feels a little more useful and practical than just a list of terms and definitions. How long does it take for your audience or the people who are attending your workshop or who may have been instructed to attend your workshop <laughs> through an employer or whomever, um, how long does it take for them to get comfortable, to put their defenses down? Because it seems to me that there would be quite a lot of that. Whether Absolutely. your focus is is trans is as a if whether the, the workshop has a transgender focus or an environmental focus, uh, how long how long does it take, have you found, for story and for you know good hearted, honest conversation to help people put their defenses down? One of the things that we do is try to share as much about ourselves as we can from the get-go. So that might be 
sharing pictures of my cats, which I am unable to stop talking about, or um, sharing our personal relationship with the topic that we're discussing, or sharing stories that we've seen from doing this work elsewhere, and really trying from the get-go to start building that emotional relationship. And that even if we don't get to have an individual conversation with every person who's attending, to at the very least help them feel like they are learning from a real live human and not from just a slide deck or a robot or a voice on a Zoom screen. And depending on the age and context and sort of the um, workplace culture or the organizational culture or the culture of whatever the, the conference or festival is, also trying to use some humor. So one of the questions I love asking at the beginning of, work of workshops is, how's everyone doing? And, and I'll ask people like thumbs up, thumbs down in the middle. And then I'll say something like, all right, for the people who have their thumbs up, are your thumbs really up? Or do you just know when a workshop presenter asks how you're doing, you're supposed to say you're doing good? And that I feel like can, can start to break that down a little bit. Again, I include those animal gifts and I'll acknowledge that like, I do this because they make me laugh and they make me smile and a hippo underwater or a baby elephant learning how to use its trunk. Like those are just fun, adorable things that are not relevant to the trainings, but are relevant to remembering that we're human and that smiling is important as well. And trying to, um, Again, be transparent that I know this material can be a lot, whether it's talking about um, the climate crisis or talking about trans rights or talking about broader issues in diversity, equity, and inclusion, and that I'm not asking everyone to memorize everything. The, and, and we'll have a couple of like, here are the key takeaways that we want for you. And if you're remembering nothing else, here's point A, B, C. And I've, and, and I've had, we've had very good luck with that as a way to, even in an hour or a 90 minute workshop, build some of a relationship, establish that rapport and try to connect with the human on both sides of the human and the audience, the human of the presenters. And it changes, you know, there are definitely um, um, organizations or festivals or, or conferences where it's a smaller turnout than we'd hoped for or it's clear that it's a company that is requiring people to be there and not everyone there is super enthusiastic about it, or it's a you know 8 a.m. session on a Saturday morning and everyone is still in bed. Um, and again, trying to be realistic of, we know not everyone is gonna take away everything, but to, do as much as we can and give people as many tools as we can so that it feels like useful material and not just one more presentation they have to sit through or one more performance that at the end of it, you go, oh, that was fun. I'm done. I'm never going to think about that again. How do you know when you've been successful or when a program has been effective? What signs do you see? What signals does, do participants give you that you were able to make a connection with them, some type of an emotional and intellectual connection with them? That's a really tough question to answer because I have had moments where I thought an audience was totally unengaged. And my read was of a quiet audience that was maybe a little bored. But then at the end, they were asking amazing questions. Or afterwards, I would get a really detailed email that showed that they had been listening and really incorporating things. So I, I love it when people are engaged and clearly engaged when they're responding in the chat, if it's online or when they're answering questions out loud, when it's in person. I love when people have clearly come with questions and come in wanting to know more about this issue or that issue, that is always really fulfilling. And particularly in the age of Zoom, I love when people are comfortable leaving their video on so I can have a sense of, of who I'm talking to. But I try, and I don't always succeed, I try not to guess 
if an audience is engaged or not, because I can think of times when I've just been wrong and I've been pleasantly wrong. I've been, I've been underestimating an audience. And then at the end learn, oh, they really were clearly engaged, but the way I was reading their body language was just not how they actually were feeling. That is easier said than done, but is a helpful reminder that we we can't know what's going on in other people's heads. And what I have sometimes felt like was bored or uninterested, I later learned was just that person's body language or thinking about things that had nothing to do with me, and they still were really glad to be there. Now, even with your performing arts background, I would think that in the beginning, say 10 years ago, you gave presentations that didn't have so much story in them or so much of a story framework in them. And then that over time, you have this wonderful story framework that you have built into all of your initiatives are very conscious of. What difference do you recall seeing between the two different approaches of not having a story and then being very mindful of story and connecting with people with intention instead of transferring information? Some of it is having learned what the research is telling us and seeing whether it's from deep canvassing, which is a, a attempt at voter persuasion that is a more in-depth relationship and conversation and that has shown really effective in, in um helping educate and communicate in ways that like mailers or door knockings often are not. Some of it is the data we have and how people respond to facts and figures versus story. Um, And then some of it is having heard from audiences in different ways. So knowing that um, I have gotten just better and more positive feedback when there's more story and when there's more memorable moments. And I also enjoy doing it more as an educator, as a facilitator or performer, that weaving in those moments of story and really trying to integrate those throughout just makes it more enjoyable for me than purely presenting dry facts and figures and gives context for those facts and figures of rather than just this is the amount of pollution that a power plant is emitting, or this is the number of transgender people who've experienced discrimination, or sort of the raw data like that, being able to say, this is an individual who I met and spoke with, and here's a bit of their story, or this is something from my life that has impacted me in this way. And it's just more fun to be able to share those stories that way than to feel like I'm lecturing or, or purely looking at dry data. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. So you mentioned power plants. You're also involved in the Sierra Club's Beyond Coal campaign. And I've um, been to the website and read about the project. And there are some sections where, there's, where there are data. Uh, but there's also what I hear coming through the website is story coming through the through the website. And what I hear is that the objective here is it's it's not an either or um, type of proposition. It, there's an and component to it because there's a mindful um, a mindful work to trans help people transition from coal to uh, cleaner energy um, and in terms of not only just the transition between these two different domains, but also economically and economic transition. Everybody's being mindful of of, um, everyone's investment in, in in these types of work. Absolutely. So to to give a little bit of of context, um, for much of my professional career, I was sort of directly and and exclusively focused on trans rights. And then uh, about two and a half years ago, joined the communications team at the Sierra Club. And the Sierra Club is a a really fabulous environmental organization. It's one of the oldest and largest in the world, founded in the 1800s. 
And one of the Sierra Club's largest initiatives is the Beyond Coal campaign, which is working to end the use of coal power in the United States. And increasingly, as more and more places are moving away from coal to skip over what a lot of utilities want, which is gas, which is is fracked gas or methane gas. And so we don't need that. We don't need that as a a quote unquote bridge fuel, which is sometimes the language that's used. We can go right to renewables, clean energy, wind, solar. And the jump there in terms of the movements was obviously a little bit of of a a change from the trans and LGBTQ movement to the environmental movement. But the way that we're talking about these issues of communicating story feels very, very similar and is what really drew me to the work at the Sierra Club. And some of this is because, again, we know, like, we've had the data since the 70s and arguably since the late 1800s. Like, we've known that burning fossil fuels warms up the world and that warming up the world is bad for human civilization. We know those things. And yet, politicians are not swayed, energy companies are not swayed, and far too often voters are not swayed. And so working in not only the sort of abstract natural beauty is important, national parks are important, save the whales, and those are all great reasons to be an environmentalist, don't get me wrong, but also the more concrete things of the climate crisis makes hurricanes worse. and billions of people live within a couple miles of oceans or water. And if we don't address the climate crisis, those impacted communities are are both going to be in trouble and become climate migrants and climate refugees that then seek a different place to live. We know that um, communities of color from centuries of racism and decades of redlining, communities of color in the more in the United States are more likely to have been forced to be near industry or near power plants. So when we're talking about clean air, it's not the environmental movement is is sometimes seen, and this has historically been somewhat somewhat true, is seen as something of a white movement. But we know that the people at the front lines, the people who live near these power plants, the people who are breathing in this coal dust or this pollution, are very often communities of color and elevating those voices, helping those voices make sure their stories are heard um, is incredibly rewarding and is critical to convincing people to care about these issues and to to take action about these issues. Um, And so being able to say, yes, the climate crisis is important because coral reefs are dying and because wildlife is being decimated and because species are going extinct. Those are all really good reasons. And also it's costing billions and trillions of dollars in property damage from increased storms. And also people are dying unnecessarily from breathing conditions and and from asthma and from pollution. And also you end up with energy problems like in Texas where it was too cold in February and the grid went down. And then it was too hot in July and August and parts of the grid had problems. And all of those are climate crisis issues. All of those are energy issues. And weaving story in and helping individuals share their stories, again, is both more effective and also just more enjoyable. It's more powerful to be able to help someone who's never told their story get an op-ed placed or help someone who feels voiceless be heard by a politician or at at a public hearing. Um, And as someone who, going back to, uh, um, I moved through the world with white privilege and able-bodied privilege and financial stability and a college education and parents and family who are supportive and all of stable housing, all of these different privileges, being able to uplift other people's voices and learn when I can take a step back has also been incredibly rewarding and, and an important thing that I think is different and hopefully better about the work that I'm doing now than when I was starting out in my early 20s. What's been the hard part of the um, Beyond Coal initiative? Um, 
One thing that has been hard is being aware of the climate crisis and seeing how it impacts real live people and not just the numbers on a chart makes it harder to, it, it makes me feel more overwhelmed about the world that um, listening to or communicating with people whose power is getting shut off or whose homes have been decimated by floods or who are concerned about their family's health because of the air quality where they live. Those are all really scary issues that we have opportunities now to, to make them better and to address them through legislation and policy. I am not always super optimistic about that legislation and policy, and, and we'll see how much things actually make a difference. So it's hard um, emotionally to help carry some of that weight. And then on the other end, it's frustrating to watch these utilities that know they have had the data for decades that what they are doing, burning fossil fuels, harms the planet, harms the climate, and harms people. And we are still hearing, you know, I, I remember talking to a colleague of mine who said that he had gotten drinks with um, an energy lobbyist for a big utility. And this lobbyist was saying over drinks at the bar after work, oh, we know coal is on the way out but we're gonna hang on to it for as long as possible and wring out every little concession we can from the progressive movement to try and get as much as we can for as long as we can. And from a purely business standpoint, like that is this person's job, but how miserable to know that they know what the problem is and they know that coal is on the way out and they know that coal is actively harming these communities and they're going to hang on to it for as long as they can and get as much money out of it as they can. And that is, is, is really lousy. How has story helped you and others in the beyond coal initiative begin conversations with decision makers and begin conversations with the people whose mind set is pretty set as you just explained. How has story helped you have conversations with them? At its simplest level, story, again, allows that interpersonal connection. One of the things that I encourage people to do when sharing their stories with policymakers, whether it's elected officials or appointed officials or whomever, is um, what is that connection you're going to find, whether it's I'm a lifelong resident of this part of the country, or um, I joke that politicians are legally required to care about local sports teams. So if, you, if you're able to make a connection about a common interest and that, um, again, showing the human and highlighting that we're, we are pushing for change, we, the environmental movement, we, the Beyond Coal campaign, are pushing for change because we want to make people's lives better. And, and that that is first and foremost, the, the sort of grounding reason. Um, and that hopefully at its best for politicians who are honestly open to learning and for policymakers who are honestly open to learning, that is maybe a surprise that, that we're coming human to human rather than, you know, environmentalist to policymaker or lobbyist to lobbyist or whatever other sort of gross titles we could think of. And that um, helping politicians or helping policymakers hear those stories is empowering to that community that wh whomever we're working with. And also ideally is like, that is those policymakers jobs to, to listen to their constituents, to listen to the public and then to do better. You have so many years of experience um, helping people see issues differently, see things differently, of helping people hear their own voice for the first time. When you look back over your shoulder at the trail you've left behind, what do you see? First, I think it's lovely to think that there's a trail to begin with, that 
as I said, I've had a, a non-traditional and what feels like a very non-linear career path. But looking back, it does really, all of the pieces fit together of performance and the arts leading into advocacy and education, leading into helping other people share their stories, leading into um, diversity, equity, and inclusion work, that all of those puzzle pieces really do seem to fit together in a way that was totally unknown to me or was totally unclear to me, you know, 15 years ago when I graduated college or 10 years ago when I started doing more advocacy work in a more focused way. I also see what I hope has been good learning on my end of the privilege that I move through the world with and how I can leverage that privilege to help others and leverage that privilege to uplift their voices and maybe learn more about when I can then take a step back or when and how I can lay groundwork or answer questions or deal with conversations that make things easier for the people who come after me, whether it's colleagues or friends or employees or whatever. On the other hand, I still look ahead and see what sometimes feels like an overwhelming amount of work to do. That one of the contradictions or, or what feels like a paradox of where we are today is that there are parts of the country and parts of the world where there has never been more renewable energy or where there has never been more trans acceptance and, and legal protections for trans people. And there are parts of the world where they have never been more polluted. They're as polluted as they've ever been or where there are politicians and, and lobbyists pushing anti-trans laws and anti-trans legislation and that it feels like, you know, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times that we are in an age of contradiction where there is just incredible opportunity and wealth and technology and positive social and economic and environmental change at the same time that there is incredible inequity and pollution and selfishness and greed. And by nature, I'm sort of a glass half empty person, but I try to look at that positive as well. So it's, it's, oh, 2020, 2021, 2016, like what a couple of years we have had and nothing is slowing down. We got to keep moving and keep fighting. What's next for you? The biggest thing that's next for me is growing and expanding Better World Collaborative of working with my friend and movement colleague, Crispin, on, on um, trying to offer what we think is a really excellent diversity, equity, and inclusion training model and, and storytelling model, um, continuing to work with the Sierra Club and get those tools out and, and fight those fights. The states I'm particularly working with right now are Minnesota and Texas, which are very a great example of where things feel very different in different parts of the country. I am also I'm I'm one year back in Chicago after four years of being in DC. I am from and grew up in and around Chicago and I'm excited to be back here and reconnecting with friends and family and Lake Michigan and um biking in a flat area. Uh DC is certainly not mountainous, but it's real hilly compared to the Midwest. Um, and as I stated at the beginning, trying to keep all those balls in the air and still find time for rest and meditation and, and playing with my cats and seeing friends and family. How can people learn more about you? Absolutely. Uh, Better World Collaborative, the, the new consulting firm that I mentioned is at betterworldcollaborative.com. Uh, you can also find my personal website at rebeccakling.com. My last name is K-L-I-N-G. I'm on Twitter at Rebecca Kling, where you will find a mix of um, complaining about politics, talking about whatever video games or movies I'm watching, and posting pictures of my cats. 
Uh, so I would love to connect with people. Um, Better World Collaborative, RebeccaKling.com, and on Twitter at Rebecca Kling. Rebecca, thank you so much for spending time with us today and for teaching us so much. It's, it's been wonderful learning from you today. It's been wonderful having this conversation. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing. And I am so appreciative, again, of your creating this podcast of, of um, uplifting voices and sharing people's experiences. And, and that's, how, that's how lasting change happens. Not always the fastest, but that's how lasting change happens. To learn more about Rebecca, Better World Collaborative, the Beyond Coal Initiative, and to view Rebecca's short film from the Earth Stories Workshop, see the links in the show notes at talaterra.com. Thank you for joining us today. See you next time. Before I go, I wanted to share with you that Rebecca will be teaching a Storytelling for Advocacy Workshop next month. In this workshop, you'll learn how to use personal stories for advocacy and social change. There'll be a focus on environmental issues and combating the climate crisis. This workshop is scheduled for Sunday, November 14, from 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. Pacific Time. You can learn more about the workshop by clicking through the link in the show notes. Hope to see you there. Talaterra is a podcast for and about independent educators working in natural resource fields and environmental education. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with friends and colleagues. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is Tanya Marion.